1 Kings chapter 11. If you'd turn there in your Bibles. 1 Kings chapter 11. I'm believing that God wants me to preach a really long sermon. Because the clock that's up here is broken. It just says 17. That's all it says. I'm taking that as a word from the Lord. Who's with me? <laughs> Two people. Man. All right. <laughs> First Kings chapter 11. We're, we're right in the beginning of a series called Conflict of Kings. We're talking about the different kings of Israel and uh, the conflicts presented within them. That's why it's named Conflict of Kings. <laughs> Okay, all right, well, uh, I thought it was a really good and descriptive name. All right. Um, we've been talking about Solomon. That's the first king that we, we started on, and there was a reason. There was a reason we started with Solomon. We didn't start with Saul. We didn't start with David, though we certainly, certainly could have many wonderful lessons to be learned from the lives of those men. But the reason why I wanted to talk about Solomon first is, in my opinion, and this isn't something you can prove through scripture, but just the, 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 the things that I'm learning from going through the kings, I really think something shifted during Solomon's reign. Something that was different than even Saul and David was something that happened during Solomon's reign. And we're finally going to get to it here this morning. But previously, we talked about how Solomon, despite his supernatural wisdom given to him by the Lord, that his mind, his intellect, the wisdom that he had right next to him, as he says in Ecclesiastes, ended up becoming something of a struggle point for him. It really wasn't a place that was totally, wholly, completely, and submitted before the Lord, um, but was something that he, he struggled in. And then last week, we talked about how the passions of Solomon, the issues of the heart, was the major way that he transgressed the ways of the Lord. And uh, what ended up happening is that he, I believe, was looking for something that only God could have satisfied deep in his heart, a Jesus-shaped hole, if you will. And he tried to fill that with romantic connections with many women and ended up uh, giving himself out and spreading himself so thin uh, over the course of, of many years. So that, so much so that later in life, he majorly went down a very, very dark path. And it's that path that we're going to talk about today. But one of the themes that I'm going to introduce is the idea of generational patterns. Generational sin, generational bondage, generational idolatry. It's something that I don't think the Bible necessarily explains so clearly like like the mechanism of it and exactly how it works. But overall, I have this observation that in many cases, one generation passes something along to another generation. This is something that you can think about as a parent to a child, like your blood child uh, or your familial child. But it also can be something that happens in the course of a discipleship relationship. As you are leading someone, as you are uh, being the usher that is showing them their seat in life, so to speak, that there can be things of your generation, if that makes sense to you, that you can be passing along to, to that generation, those, those people. And uh, this theme is, is, I think, so clear in the life of Solomon and what he ended up introducing that became a consistent pattern of struggle points for generations, multiple, plural, after, after Solomon uh, had died even. So we're going, we're going to introduce that. There's going to be a part during the teaching where you are going to be quite depressed. And then we're going to come up from there, okay? <laughs> we're going to end on a very hopeful note. I'm telling you right now, you're going to feel a little heavy, probably, in the middle. But then we're going to bring it, we're going to bring it back up. Okay. Thank the Lord for his hope, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so we're going to read about what, what were the things actually that Solomon ended up struggling with as a result of his romantic relationships with these many women? Because those things in and of themselves, certainly it was sin because God said don't do that. 
but they were kind of like a stepping stone to something else. And what I want to show you is what that something else is, and it's the else that continued for generations. All right? So 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 1. Now, King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, who was his first wife, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women, from the nations concerning which the Lord said to the sons of Israel, you shall not associate with them, and neither shall they associate with you, for they will surely turn your heart away after their gods. Solomon held fast to these in love. I mentioned this last week, but I, I just want to underline it for us all here this morning. There's this mantra, there's this belief in the world that love is like the purest thing you could, you could get. And you ought to spend your life like just looking for that love that is so pure and so just, mm, yeah, that's it. And if you have that, no matter what the context is, no matter what the love is for, who it's for, whatever, it doesn't matter. Love is undefilable. You can't like sully love. So get it, it's pure, and just go after it. But the Bible teaches us something very, very different. And here we have a great example of Solomon with romantic connection actually led him to some very dark places. And it's almost, I mean, if I'm just being honest, okay, it's almost unbelievable to me to look at, this was the trigger point for Solomon, his romantic connection, and then this is where he ended up. Because it seems like such a long distance to travel. But see, this is, this is a little Bible reading pro tip for you here, okay? If that's like, what? How could that possibly happen? Don't hold fast to your own opinion, but let the truth of what the Bible is telling you change your opinion. Because if it's confronting you and you're like, I can't, what? I, 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 that means that there's something inside of you that isn't quite lining up with what the truth of the scripture is, and it's time for a change of perspective. So what I'm learning is that, wow, okay, even something that could seem harmless in a way, like what's the problem with these relationships? I mean, I, you know, I get that it's sin, but then to see where it, where it leads, I'm learning something about how serious the initial steps are in going down these paths that can end up in such a dark place. Are you, are you tracking with me here? Okay, so I'm sharing with you some of the bewildering moments I've had as I'm reading the Bible, and I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? We're going to have quite a few of those this morning. All right. Are you awake? Are you alive? Barely. I'll take it. Verse number three. Solomon had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned his heart away. So what was going on was God's like, Solomon, don't connect with these women because they are actively serving these other gods. And they're going to end up influencing you. But Solomon and his foolishness did it anyway. Verse number four, for it came about when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. I see another influencing factor here. I mean, the Bible specifically calls out, it says here in verse 4, for it came about when Solomon was just starting out. Poor guy didn't know any better. He was super young, just learning about God. Nope, doesn't say that. It says he was old. After all that experience, after all that wisdom, after all that following after God, even still, there were connection points for him that ended up being so unhealthy that led him to a dark place. It's another bewildering moment for me. That teaches me something. It teaches me that I don't want to have a pride of heart as I look back at my old experience and say, <laughs> I got this. I just, I just want to come humbly before the Lord and say, God, I need you as much, if not more than ever. And I want to stay there. I never want to move out of that place. He was old and his heart was turned away. But what did he do? Verse 5. Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the detestable idol of the Ammonites. And Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. It did not follow the Lord fully as David his father had done. 
Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable idol of Moab, on the mountain which is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the detestable idol of the sons of, of Ammon. And thus he did for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. Okay. So when I previously read this, I guess what I was thinking was his relationship with these many women was the thing that, that was the, the kind of the, the apex of the sin that Solomon had engaged in. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says he was connecting with these women. They ended up influencing him to worship these, these false gods. And uh, if you've been listening to me for many weeks now, you know that I have like buckets at the ready when I read the Bible and I want to put things in a good bucket or a bad bucket. So I just read through this and I was like, whatever, Ashtoreth of whomever, who cares, whatever, bad guy, bad bucket. And I just kind of moved on. Like Solomon did bad things is kind of what I translated that in my mind. But I became a little curious, like what exactly was that all about? What were these different gods all about and, and what was Solomon engaging in or, or making way for in his, in his life? So I'm going to share some of my research with you. I found information on two out of the three of them. I couldn't find anything about uh, Chemosh from Moab, but I found information about the other two that I wanted to share with you because I think it's insightful, especially to understand the generational aspect of all of this. Okay, the first one is Ash Tereth, which was a Sidonian goddess. I'm just scanning the room for ages. Um, this goddess was associated with three things, fertility, sexuality, and war. When, when people in those days would create, remember we talked about high places, they would create an idol, okay? And that's the place where they would end up worshiping or performing these, frankly, really grotesque practices at the location of, of the idol, physically at, the, at that place. And uh, we won't, I'm not going to go into gruesome detail here, but you can imagine the kinds of practices that would be performed in order to appease or please a goddess of fertility, sexuality, and war. Um, so that was Ashtoreth, a Sidonian, Sidonian god. Um, the second one that I found information on was the Ammonite god, Milcom, Malcolm, or Molech. Scholars think that those are kind of like equivalent, kind of sort of nicknames, as it were for the same God. And this God is even more intense than that. This God was the God where they would perform child sacrifice, typically in the idol itself. They would make cavities where they would put fire and they'd have different levels of, this, of these cavities to sort of represent like the ascension into the spiritual realm that these kids would have as they would literally take their children and they would sacrifice them so brutally, so disgustingly um, at, this, at this idol. So remember what I said when I was like, what? Romantic relationship to sacrificing your children. Like, how did that happen? What? What are we talking about here? But that should teach me, all of us, the seriousness of straying with respect to the romantic relationships that God says, this is the way that I want you to do it. And I don't, I don't want to compromise even for a second, even for a, a toe of mine to transgress in those ways especially now that I'm learning these kinds of things. This God, this Ammonite God, his name was thought to mean king. Whoa. So Solomon was literally worshiping a God whose name was king instead of, instead of the true king. Whenever the Bible talks about offspring, procreation, um, children, it is often an analogy for your future. And so you might be thinking, if I don't have kids, how does this really connect with me? Well, it can represent your future in God. Like, where, where is this going? Where is your life going in God? And what I have found about idolatry is that, is that the, the sinister spiritual beings that are animating the idols, that are providing those hooks, often go after two things. The first one is your identity. And the second one is your future. Your future. Okay, so Solomon was making these idols, condoning the worship of them, if not participating himself, and he didn't want to let go of all of that because he loved, he loved these people, he loved these women, very sobering. 
Okay, because we're going to run out of time, even though it's still 17, apparently. That's what time it is. That's what it says. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to tell you about a couple other places in Scripture to give you a sense of the longevity of the idolatry. Okay, so in Nehemiah chapter 13, you can look it up later, as I know you all will. <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 13, it's the last chapter in Nehemiah. So Solomon was kind of the apex. You can think of him as like the pinnacle of like the best periods of Israel's nation career, okay? Except for the last part of his, of his life, of course, when he was, he was wrapped up in idolatry. Then after that, things just degraded pretty quickly from there. There were some okay spots, some good spots even, but really things quite degraded, so much so that Israel as a nation hit a dramatic rock bottom, and in fact, they were conquered militarily by, by uh, some outside force. They were taken in captivity, most of them. And then like the poorest of the poor, the weakest of the weak were left in Jerusalem in the, the, the heap of rubble that was left over from that conquest of Jerusalem. And what was once, you know, Solomon's splendor, the temple of God, it was all just torn down. The walls were torn down. The temple was torn down. The altar was out of place. It was just completely horrible. And then in the book of Nehemiah, we read about how this wonderful man, Nehemiah, shows up on the scene to a horrible sight, but then begins working with the people to start to come up from that place of rock bottom. He helps them see that the reason why they were there is no one else's fault except for theirs, that they had so given themselves over to these, these very same idolatries for years upon years and generations upon generations, and that's the reason why God said, finally, there has to be a change. Because clearly sending these prophets, clearly sending these leaders is not doing a thing. You're just on this completely destructive path, and if you keep going, you will be utterly destroyed. So God intervened really powerfully, sent them into captivity, and here was Nehemiah trying to pick up, pick up the pieces uh, inspired by the Lord. So he, he begins to do so. The people start to rebuild the wall. They rebuilt the temple. They're rebuilding the wall. And then they realize we are the reason why this happened in the first place. And do you know what they do? They weren't blaming everyone. Well, the Babylonians this and the Ammonites forced me to do that. And you should have heard what they said to me first before I did all that. They didn't do any of that. They spent like days, like, like 20 or 30 days just repenting. I mean, they went through a lot of stuff. Things were going great. Nehemiah reintroduced the patterns of God in their lives. Things were going well. Society was beginning to be rebuilt. They had the favor of the king who was, who was kind of overseeing them at the time. It was going really well. Then Nehemiah leaves, and he comes back, and that's where we read about in Nehemiah chapter 13, that Nehemiah comes back from a trip, and he sees them doing exactly the same things that they had done previously. And he literally names Solomon. He's like, what are you thinking? Solomon, who was loved by God, who was the wisest guy that ever lived, he was led astray by exactly the same things that you are doing right now. That's what Nehemiah said hundreds of years later because the people had still been struggling with the same things. Evan, by same things, what do you mean same things? You mean like, Generally speaking, they were sinning because we all sin, so what's the big deal? No, I mean the same things. When you go back and you read Nehemiah, some of the main antagonists, the bad guys, one of them, his name is Tobiah. Any Bible scholars know where Tobiah is from? Ammon. Ammonite. Remember reading that in here? Uh, Molech, the god of the Ammonites. How did Tobiah worm his way in there? Guess what? Through marriages. Things got so confused to Israel that even Nehemiah, sent by God, couldn't tell the difference between a true Israelite and imposter Israelites. Because what Tobiah the Ammonite and others were doing was they were marrying themselves into Israel even though they were totally enemies. I know it sounds crazy, like why would, why would you give your, your daughter to marry someone who hates you? Why would you do that? I don't know, why do you engage in fear? 
oh, a little different now, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Even though it's not logical, I still find myself doing it. Why do you pop off in anger all the time, even though you know it's killing you inside? You know how anger can get very violent externally? What do you think is going on in your heart when you engage in anger? You are beating up your own heart when you do that. So why would you give yourself over to that? Same reason. There are hooks that compel us, even though if we were thinking straight, we might not want to do that. Remember when I said you'd feel heavy at some point during the teaching? This is about the time when you're going to feel that. We're, we're going to take it up. We're going to go way up from there, okay? We're going to follow the path of the Israelites in hope, all right? So stick with me. So Tobiah was, was infiltrating Israel by, by marriages. And Nehemiah says, you've got to be kidding me. You're doing this again? This is exactly the way that this whole mess was introduced to us in the first place. And he referenced Solomon. That's why I chose Solomon to start because I think this, these decisions that he made um, ended up setting a pattern of, of generational idolatry that these people struggled in for, for years upon years upon years. Okay. You know, the flip side of this is true. Why, why, why is this a thing, Evan? Like, why do you even think a generational bondage or generational sin even exists? I'll tell you. I believe that God has made us to be influential beings, that whether you want to or not, whether you mean to or not, you will influence the people around you. It's a tremendous privilege when we use that to benefit people. But it's also a sobering reality when even the ways that I don't mean to, I'm still influencing people and maybe not for the better. Maybe not for the better. You are influential whether you mean to or not. Okay, go back to 1 Kings chapter 11. I want to talk about something that I just, oh Lord, this is so hopeful. I want to deliver this message to you. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 7. I'm going to focus on a small little detail here. It says, Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable idol of Moab, on the mountain which is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the detestable idol of the sons of Ammon, and thus he did many times over. I'm going to focus on that phrase, on the mountain which is east of Jerusalem. For any Bible scholars out there, that mountain actually has a name, a well-known name. And that is the Mount of Olives. So I'm just going to let that sink in. All those grotesque, horrible things that Solomon engaged in was done physically on the Mount of Olives. Some of you were like, and? <laughs> yes, that seems important. <laughs> let, me try, let me try to convey what I believe the Lord spoke to me for us on this. The Mount of Olives was actually a pretty special place for Jesus during his time on earth. And uh, I never really understood why, but I think I'm beginning to understand why. When Jesus entered into Jerusalem, um, very near the end of his life, so he was going into Jerusalem, and he knew that he was going to be crucified, and that's when he was going to suffer, to die, and to rise again. So he's coming into Jerusalem, and many of you might remember the, the, the episode when he comes in we call it the triumphal entry. It's because he comes in with much fanfare and people saying Hosanna, laying the palm fronds down. But he rode in on a donkey. And there's just this beautiful contrast of the king coming into his rightful place on a donkey. <laughs> just the humility that he had by riding on a donkey. Uh, it just bears a lot of contrast with what a lot of people thought that he was going to do, which was like, I'm here and so is my army. Let's go. And so they, they kind of didn't know what to do with that. But anyway, they were still celebrating it as he was coming into Jerusalem. So it's the triumphal, triumphal entry. But here's a really interesting little known fact about Jesus' time in Jerusalem. Do you know he left every night? He didn't stay in Jerusalem during that time. He would leave at night. Where would he go? Great question. He would go a couple different places as far as I can tell in the scriptures. One is Bethany, but the other one is the Mount of Olives. 
near his, the time of his death, Jesus was spending a lot of time at the Mount of Olives. He would pray, he would bring his disciples, and he would just be there. He would just let his presence be in that place. You see where I'm going with this? Let's take it a step further. What had been done on that mountain was parents had brought their children and sacrificed them before this horrific demon god, Molech. Sacrificed them in order to appease, in order to be okay, in order to have good standing with Molech. And here, during Jesus' life, we have a very different picture of a different son who of his own accord decided to lay down his life as a sacrifice so that no one ever had to pay such a price of sacrifice ever again to any god, Moloch or otherwise. Famously, when, when Judas came and he betrayed Jesus, he did it in the Garden of Gethsemane. Guess where the Garden of Gethsemane is? It's at the base of the Mount of Olives. So Jesus started his sacrificial process at the Mount of Olives as if to punctuate the point, those places in your life where you have done the worst is the place that Jesus wants to spend the most time. This is what he spoke to me about our hearts today, that by all rights, Jesus ought to be able to come into your heart and my heart as king and just plop himself down in the temple of your heart and be your ultimate king. Be the one that dictates things. Be the one of the ultimate authority in your life. But just as kindly and perhaps even as quietly as he did physically back then, he wants to say to us this morning, I want to spend some time in those places where you have most egregiously defiled who you are, who I meant for you to be in my connection with you where we might want to sweep those things underneath the rug and just forget about them. Does anybody have anything like that in your life? Something you know you've done, places you've been, and you just don't want to talk about it. I just wish we could all move on. Can't we just move on, please? I believe Jesus is saying, no, we can't. Why? Why? Why can't we just move on? I believe it's because Jesus wants to redeem the worst places of your life to prove to you that everything else is also possible. So he conquered death. For many of us, we can't really identify with that because we've never been in danger of dying. But for all of us, I think we have that thing or those things. It might be a mountain range of olives for you. We have that thing that's like irredeemable, horrible time of my life. I can't even believe I went there. I can't even get, I can't even say it because I'm so ashamed. I'm so whatever. And Jesus is asking, will you allow me to come and just spend some time on that mountain? And that's my question to you this morning. What is your Mount of Olives? And are you willing to allow the Lord king to just spend time there i promise you he will not bring his whips okay this isn't jesus saying like all right you really messed up let's go i'm gonna teach you how to that's no jesus just went there he just spent time there as if that wasn't enough after Jesus was resurrected from the dead and he was going to be with the Father, ascending into heaven, he gathered all the people, guess where? The Mount of Olives. Kidding me? He's like, this is gonna be my launching place for going back to the Father. And then we learn in Zechariah chapter 14, verse four, Jesus says, when I come back, guess what's gonna happen? He's going to come back to the Mount of Olives and it's going to split in two, it says, between east and west. The Mount of Olives is going to be a focal point of the re-entry 
of Jesus Christ into this world. You tracking with me here? Like the, the, I don't even know how to say it even worse. I'm trying to think of these horrible adjectives like grotesque and horrible and blah. In those places, that's where Jesus wants to spend time. That's where he started his, his sacrifice process. That's where he went back to be with the Father, and that's where he's coming back again. That is what God wants to do in our lives. But I just keep, I can't get away from this picture in my mind of Jesus just slowly coming into Jerusalem on that donkey, unassuming, not really expecting much, coming in humbly, coming in gently. And that's what I believe God is wanting to say about your Mount of Olives. He just wants to come in gently, and he just wants to spend some time there. The sense that I have from the Lord is that we're talking about some pretty raw things here. If, if, if you're, if, if you're, uh, if you, gosh, what am I trying to say? Um, if you feel like you don't know how to hear the voice of the Lord, let me try to explain. This is what it might feel like. As I've been talking, you've been kind of listening to be nice to me, but you just keep thinking about this one thing. You just keep thinking about it and you're like, no, no, that can't possibly be it. Anyway, back to listening and you keep thinking about it again. You keep thinking about it again. That's the Lord. That's the Lord reminding you of something. And so then the decision point on your plate is, am I going to engage in this, or am I really just going to swat it away? That's the invitation of the Lord to revisit some of these places that you might even be scared to. You might even have done it before. You might even have tried to allow the healing process of the Lord redeem something in your life. And all I'm here to say as your usher is I think there's a seat that God wants you to sit in. And I believe he wants to do something pretty powerful in that seat if you would like to sit there. Something for you to consider. Something for you to take action on and not for just me to do for you. Because I can't. <laughs> We're talking about the king here. What time is it? All right. We're okay. We've got another 45 minutes. <laughs> Divided by 45 is one minute. Um, okay. So I, I, hope this is, I hope this is sinking in. I'm talking about something that lasted a really long time in Israel. I'm talking about something that Solomon ought to be embarrassed by, <laughs> frankly. These horrible things that he did. And Jesus saying, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to redeem that place. It's going to be my launching point, actually, for engaging in the most important thing in human history, which is to erase the ultimate consequence for these kinds of things in the world. I just believe that God is wanting to convince you, dear one, of his power. I mean, really. We're talking about, as the Bible says, age-old devastations age-old, things that have been gone for a long time. We're talking about things that are so raw. It might even make you, and I'm not, I'm not being funny here, okay? It might even make you panic thinking about even talking about this. Those are the kinds of things that I'm talking about here. The Lord wants to meet you in those places. Let's pray. Let's just take a moment with every, every head bowed and every eye closed. And I just want to give you a chance to ask the Lord if there's a mount of olives in, in your life that he's wanting to, to visit. Let's just spend a couple, a few seconds here just being quiet before the Lord. But be faithful in asking him, God, is there something? Is there a place you want to meet me? Is there something you want to do in my life? And let the answer be whatever it is. If it's no, that's okay. If it's yes, listen.
as I continue to pray, would you really try to focus on hearing the voice of the Lord? Okay, you're not hearing my voice. You're hearing the voice of the Lord speaking to you. I want to pray for you while you're doing that, okay? Lord, I pray for my friends, these dear, dear ones of yours, your beloveds, the ones that you came to die for, to suffer for, to be resurrected for. I pray that you would give them insight into those places of their lives that you were wanting to visit. Lord, I just pray for your healing touch, that gentle touch that only our Heavenly Father can give. That just by your presence, Lord, begins to heal things that have not been well for many years. And even now as I'm praying, Lord, I believe your touch is, is happening that you are addressing wrongs, offenses, wounds, idols, sin, right now, with your presence. Church, I believe the Lord would say to us this morning, my child, you do not need to be afraid because I am here. You do not need to be afraid. And just like Jesus said to the disciples, when he was resurrected and came back and they didn't even know what to do with that, he said, do not be afraid. And I'm giving you my Holy Spirit, my very presence in your life, so you never have to be afraid. Do not be afraid of your Mount of Olives. It will not be a mountain of shame or embarrassment or panic anymore. But the Lord wants to redeem that place and to use it as a launching point into doing even more ministry in your life and in the lives of the people around you. But you need to choose, friend. You need to choose to allow the Lord to come to that place. I just want to ask if there's anyone here with every head bowed, every eye closed, if there's anyone here this morning who's never received Jesus as king in your Jerusalem, so to speak, your heart, you don't have a relationship with God, and you're hearing me talk about generational stuff, and you're realizing, God, there's things in my life that I've picked up that are not right. I just want to give this opportunity for you in a, in a second to make a decision to invite him in as king, and whoever else you've been calling king you want to supplant them with the true king, the one king, Jesus Christ, who comes in humbly to your life and wants to visit a Mount of Olives in your heart. Is there anyone here this morning who wants to do that? If you could look up at me and even signal me with your hand. I just never want to miss an opportunity to extend that invitation. Well, Lord, we thank you for how you visit us in those rawest places of our hearts. Thank you, Lord. We love you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, listen, folks, before you go, I just want to say, for now, today, in this time, if, if something was resonating with you, something's on your heart, can I just give you a little bit of instruction here as your pastor, if, if I am your pastor? Um, go to your leaders about that. Small group leader would be very appropriate to go to, an apprentice leader, and talk about the things that you believe might be being stirred up in your heart. If you're not in a small group, that's okay. Maybe you'd want to consider joining a small group to have opportunity to do things like this regularly. Uh, but also our pastoral team would be more than happy to have a conversation with you about this. Whoever your leaders are in your life, your mentors who know the scriptures, go to them about this. And say, I think God is wanting to visit me here. And just for today, I... I want to treat you like adults. Is that all right with you? Okay. Every other day I'm going to treat you like, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> this is what I mean by that. I just, I want to encourage maturity of discipline. And, and we could have brought people up here to have, you know, a prayer team here to pray for you if in the moment you're feeling that. And there would be nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying for today, what I'm sensing from the Lord is, let's have a discipline about pursuing our leaders 
to get this stuff worked out in our lives instead of only just wanting to respond emotionally in a moment. Because I'm telling you, what's next? As Jesus spends time in your Mount of Olives, you're going to need more than emotion to, to work through that. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just trying to be real with you, okay? And uh, it just, it might take some time. But what helps is to have people who can just usher you to the seat. Usher you to the seat, okay? So please be faithful in that. And uh, otherwise, we'll, we'll see you next week. God bless you.